Good evening, everyone. My name is Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Open Mind program on ADD and ADHD. We are so honored and so fortunate to have with us world-renowned expert on ADD and ADHD and author, Dr. Thomas Brown. We are so lucky that Dr. Brown moved from the East Coast where he was a professor and had, was the co-director of the clinic at the Yale Clinic for Attention and Related Disorders for over 20 years. And he moved in, in 2017 to Manhattan Beach to be near his family, his, his son and daughter and grandchildren. So finding that out from my dear friend, Dr. Victoria Waller, who is an educator, um, that Thomas Brown had moved here, we immediately booked him to speak at our open mind. So we are very, very lucky and fortunate that he is here with us this evening. Dr. Brown's clinic is in Manhattan Beach. It's the new clinic for attention and related disorders. Uh, he has pamphlets outside by the books, so you can pick one up on your way out. His clinic offers assessment and treatment for children, adolescents, and adults with ADD and ADHD and related problems. After serving on the faculty of the Yale Medical School for 20 years, he, Dr. Brown then accepted an appointment, and we're not going to hold this against him, as an adjunct clinical associate professor of psychiatry and, Bi and biobehavioral sciences at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. <laughs> but that's OK. That's OK. We're not going to hold it against him. Dr. Brown has received numerous awards, including an award of honor by the National Attention Deficit Disorder Association. That's a hard one to say. I think maybe my ADD is coming in here. And a distinguished professional award from the HELP Group in Los Angeles. He's given lectures and workshops throughout the United States and internationally published more than 30 scientific articles in professional journals, and is the author of the Brown Attention Deficit Disorder Scales for Children, Adolescents, and Adults, Attention Deficit Disorder, The Unfocused Mind in Children and Adults, and of course, his most recent book, which we're here to learn about this evening, Outside the Box, Rethinking ADD, ADHD in Children and Adults, A Practical Guide. Now, before we welcome Dr. Brown to the podium. I just want to say for those of you who are here for the first time with us, this is part of the Friends of the Semmel Institute's Open Mind series that brings together renowned authors and scientists and filmmakers to speak about mental health issues. We offer this as a free public service to the community, but of course we couldn't do it without the support of our members. Um, we function very much like public television or public radio. If you feel that this is a worthwhile program and would like to see us continue, we hope that you'll join our community of supporters. Um, you can do so by taking home an envelope on your way out this evening or go to our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org, where you'll also find a calendar of upcoming events. And I'm very excited to say it's not posted quite yet, but on October 9th, we are going to host a, um, a preview screening of the movie Beautiful Boy um, with Steve Carell and Timothy Chalamet. Um, some of you may remember that we had the author, uh, David Sheff, and his son Nick come to speak when their books came out. And because we have a relationship with them, we were very fortunate we're going to get a preview of that movie. David and Nick will both be with us that evening, along with two of the physicians here at UCLA who worked with the family. So without further ado, please give a warm UCLA welcome <laughs> to Dr. Thomas E. Brown. Thanks, Vicki. Thank you. Good evening. 
Uh, I'd like to thank uh, friends of Semmel uh, for inviting me in spite of my being a foreigner. Uh, and I'd like to share with you uh, tonight some of the things that I've been thinking about and learning. Uh, many of them are uh, in this book, which is referred to, and uh, some are coming from other places, and some are not yet written down in books. Uh, but we're here to think about the area of ADD, ADHD, uh, and to think of it in a somewhat different way. Let me give you a, uh, an idea of what I have in mind to do tonight. I'd like to uh, introduce the idea that ADHD uh, is being reconceptualized in light of more recent neuroscience and clinical research, and uh, as the uh, executive function impairment. And we'll talk about that first. And then I'd like to introduce something which I think of as the central mystery about ADHD. You'll hear me use the terms ADD and ADHD interchangeably tonight. And then we'll talk a little bit about cognitive chemistry of motivation, because motivation is a very big part of what people with ADHD struggle with. But I'm going to be talking first about how it works for all of us. And then we'll talk specifically about the impact of ADHD on motivation. And then I'll spend a few minutes at the end talking about uh, medication treatment and what it does and does not do. So let's go. This picture. Uh, comes from one of the first illustrated books for children. Uh, it was published in 1845 uh, by author Heinrich Hoffmann in Germany. And it consisted of 10 illustrations like this to show how kids, uh, particularly restless kids, uh, got into trouble and made trouble for their families. See that naughty, restless child growing more rude and wild till his chair falls over quite? Philip screams with all his might, catches at the cloth, and then makes matters worse again. Down upon the ground they fall, glasses, plates, knives, forks, and all. How Mama did fret and frown when she saw them tumbling down, and Papa made such a face. Philip is in sad disgrace. That's an illustration of the view that many people still have of ADHD. Little kids who have trouble sitting still, who won't shut up and are driving everybody nuts. Uh, and we've come a long way in our scientific understanding about this, but this is something which is not adequately talked about even in medical education or in psychological professional education or in education of educators. And so what I'd like to do is share with you a little bit about what we've learned from there. We certainly know that there are still a lot of kids who are too hyper, but there's a lot more involved. But even that's not a brand new idea. Back in 1891, a French physician, uh, Ferdinand Lavoyne, wrote about adults who lack strength in their nervous system. That was the model they were using in those days. But recognize this, intelligent academics who can no longer do their work. Their attention cannot focus on the subject of their studies. Their thoughts fly every which way. Their imaginations take them far away from their subject. We're talking about something that has to do with the brain's mechanism for managing thought and action. So here's the short version of it. Up until the most recent diagnostic manual for the DSM, the Diagnostic Criteria for Psychiatry, uh, ADHD had a lot of different names, but what we call now ADHD, it was uh, minimal brain dysfunction and uh, you know, hyperkinetic disorder. But the notion of it was these were kids who made trouble and were very hard to manage. And the newer model that we're working with now that I'd like to tell you about in a little more detail, we can write as a statement that says ADHD equals developmental impairments of the brain's self-management system, its executive functions. Let me give you an idea of what we're talking about by that. This is a wide range of central control processes of the brain that connect and then prioritize and integrate our cognitive functions for us moment by moment. The metaphor I use for thinking about it is picture a symphony orchestra where all the musicians are really good at playing their instruments. Regardless of how good they may be, if you don't have a conductor who can select what they're going to play and get each individual musician to play his or her specific part in the same piece at the same time, and who can keep them on time and bring in the strings and then fade out the strings, pull in the timpani and bring in the brass, who can organize them and start them and stop them without a good conductor, you don't get very good music out of a symphony. 
The problems in brain that are affected in ADHD are not with those parts of brain that would correspond to the individual musicians. It's one level up in those neural networks that function as the conductor of the brain symphony. Mira Lisak, who's done a lot of work in, in neuropsychology, said, you know, when we're talking about executive function, really what that is, is what addresses the question of, will you do it? And if you're going to do it, how are you going to do it? And when the hell are you going to get around to it? You know, will you do it gets at issues of motivation and activation and getting started. How will you do it? Planning and organization. When? Timing and remembering and remembering to remember. And these things work in, in very dynamic ways. The subtitle of my first book on this subject uh, was uh, The Unfocused Mind. But what we're talking about here is not focus as in hold the camera still while I take a picture. No, no. It's more like focus on your driving. Think about what you do when you focus on your driving. You're not locking your eyes on the bumper of the car in front of you. You may be watching that. But you're also looking at your rear view mirror to see what's coming up behind you. You're looking down the street to see that that light is turning from green to red and you've got to get your foot off the accelerator and over toward the brake. You've got to watch a truck that's backing out of the driveway, a few pedestrians who are running across the street. The cops have got somebody stopped over there and you're kind of curious about what they've got them for and is there anybody you know? Uh, and meanwhile, you've got to be moving over toward the left because you're getting ready to make a left turn down at the next corner and while you're doing that, you're thinking about what you're going to get when you get to the grocery store. Think about what you're doing when you're focusing on your driving. You're ignoring some things, remembering some other things you just saw, thinking about where it is you have to go, and putting all that together using working memory and focus and shifting focus in order safely to drive the car. It's that kind of complex, integrated cognitive operations that we're talking about when we're talking about the executive functions of the brain. All right, so how big a deal is it? Does everybody in the world have this? No. Uh, best estimates we've got now, there are problems with all these statistics, but about 9% of elementary school age kids, an equal number of adolescents, and in adults, they used to think, you know, that this would go away once you got to be about 14. And we now know that that's true for only 3 out of 10. 7 out of 10 people who have this when they're kids are still going to have it, certainly uh, in early adulthood, and sometimes long beyond that. They used to say it was mostly a little boy's thing. Six boys for every one girl is what they were telling us when I went to school. And then they went out, that was a number they got by counting kids dragged into child guidance clinics. And then they went out and did epidemiological studies and found it was three boys for every one girl. But you know what's happened in clinics where we're seeing adults with this? It's much closer to one to one. What does that tell you? It tells you there are a lot of girls and women out there who have these difficulties, who are not being identified or provided any support or help until they get old enough to be able to bring themselves in to get that help. And that makes it very difficult for a lot of girls and women. Cross cuts all levels of IQ. In our clinic we see people who are some super, super, super smart, high average, middle average, low average, slow. Doctors and lawyers and professors and business big shots, a lot of people, a whole variety of intellectual abilities. It's not specific to any one particular level. Cross cuts all socioeconomic levels and it runs in families. Out of every four people diagnosed with ADD, one of them's got a mom or dad who's got it, whether they know it or not. And the other three, if they don't have a parent who has it, usually they've got a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, a cousin, or a brother or sister. Here's the genetic data. This is, just, this is on a bunch of, of uh, studies with heritability coefficients where it runs from zero to one. If you say zero means genes don't have much to do with it, and this is comparing twins, of course, uh, and one means that's pretty much the story. Well, uh, for height, it's about 0.9. Schizophrenia, about 0.7. Asthma, about 0.4. Breast cancer, about 0.2 and a half. ADHD, 0.76. And we've got even more clinical trials and, and uh, checking this stuff out now than we had at the time this slide was made. It really runs in families. Nobody signs up for it. Now before I start talking specifically about what's included in these executive functions, uh, there are two points. One I want to explain now, the other one I'll explain in a few minutes. First of all, when I start talking about it, you're going to see everything I'm talking about as characteristic of ADHD 
is an issue that all of us have sometimes. This is not an all or nothing deal like pregnancy. You are pregnant or you are not pregnant and there's nothing in between. It's more like depression. Everybody gets bummed out once in a while, but just because somebody's unhappy for a couple of days does not mean you're going to diagnose them as clinically depressed. It's only when those depressive symptoms are persistent and pervasive and making a lot of trouble for me say, yeah, that's a depression. We ought to do something about it. Far more problematic, though, is the second bullet here. And this is just a teaser because we're going to be getting to, into this issue more substantially in a few minutes. And that is the situational variability of the symptoms. And by that, all I mean is this simple fact. I've seen thousands of children, teenagers, and adults with ADHD, and every one of them, every one of them has a few activities in which they are able to exercise these functions that I'm talking about as executive functions perfectly well, even though they are not able to exercise them for many other things they know they damn well they ought to be able to do. You know, that's the central mystery, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. But meanwhile, Let's take a look at what we're including in this cluster we're talking about as executive functions. Now, let me make a couple of points about this. One is that those words down at the bottom, activation, focus, effort, emotion, and memory, and action, uh, this doesn't mean these are unitary variables where the, the boxes are just all one thing. This is, you could think about this more as baskets of related cognitive functions. Second point is most of the tasks that require executive function, and that's not everything we do, uh, are going to involve a need, not just for one or two of these, but usually interacting all of them, or at least many of them. Third, and this is the part which may be a little more controversial in the literature, but I think there's solid basis for it, and that is these operate mostly unconsciously. Not unconscious in the psychoanalytic sense of repression, but more in the sense of automaticity. They happen so fast that you do not have time to think about it. It's something that you just put together and do. But let's look at them a little more specifically so you get some sense of what I'm talking about. I've written quite a bit about it. If you want more details, uh, there's material you can get it. But getting problems with getting organized and then prioritizing and being able to get started on stuff. Uh, many people have trouble organizing their stuff. Their bills, their papers, their books, their living space being a big, bigger mess than most other people unless there's somebody else there helping them take care of it. Often they have difficulty estimating time and prioritizing tasks. They'll often think that they're going to be able to get something done a lot faster than they can really do it. But the other thing that happens is that they often have trouble getting started on tasks that they know they need to do. Clearest example of that I've ever seen is an attorney I saw one time. The guy came in and he said, you know, all my life I've had trouble getting started on my work when I have to work by myself. He said, I don't have any trouble when I'm talking with clients or I'm working with other lawyers, but when I go to my office and shut the door and I have paperwork to do, I don't get anything done. He said, it's so frustrating because a couple of times a week, I'll set aside several hours to do paperwork. I want to get done. I need to get it done because I'm, I'm not going to get paid until I get it done. I've got all the stuff I need. Nobody's bothering me. The door is shut. Secretary can hold the calls. I've got all the stuff right in front of me. I don't touch it. I end up turning on the computer and check my emails. They don't send out notes to a few people. I then check a couple of news sites and see what's going on in the world. And then mysteriously, this video game appears on my screen. I'll be doing that for the next two or three hours. I go home at the end of the day. My work's not done. I have a bite to eat, watch a little TV. And about 10 o'clock at night, it dawns me, oh my god. I've got this report. I've got to get into the office at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. If I don't get that thing done, I'm going to be in very serious trouble at work tomorrow. He said, at that point, I've got no problem. I can get on my home computer and work very efficiently. I'm 10 o'clock at night till 3 in the morning and produce an excellent report. But it's a hell of a way to live. Everybody gets jammed on deadlines once in a while. People with ADD, it's almost like they can't really get started often until it really begins to feel to them like it's an emergency. Focus. Often people with ADD will tell when they're trying to think about something, when they're trying to follow a discussion in a meeting, or when they're in a conversation, or when they're trying to read something, that often they get focused very well for a little bit and then they sort of drift off and then they're back and they drift off. And a lot, it's, it's a lot like what happens if you're listening to your car radio and you arrive too far away from the station you're listening to. It keeps going in and out on you. They're often easily distracted by thoughts that are going on inside their head or by things that are going on around them. But let me give you an example of something that we've learned in our clinic about how it impacts reading. There are three questions that we include in our evaluations 
where it will save somebody. Look, I'm going to ask you three questions about reading. And for each of the reading questions, I'd appreciate if you think of reading not as reading something you'd pick out because you like it. But this is just something that's assigned. You have to read it for school or read it for work or something like that. We have no special interest in it. When you're doing that kind of reading, do you find that as you read, you try to follow it and your mind just keeps drifting off thinking about a bunch of other stuff that has nothing to do with what you're reading? Question number two. When you're doing that kind of reading, do you find that as you read, you understand it okay at the moment you read it, but then it just doesn't stick inside your head? So if you have to answer questions about it or do anything with it, often you've got to go back and read it once or twice or three times more. Number three, when you're doing that kind of reading, you can understand it, but do you find that after you get finished, you can remember a few details of what you've read, but if somebody were to say to you, hey, look, one simple sentence, what's the main idea here? It's kind of hard to put it together. Ask those three questions of somebody with ADHD, being sure that we're talking about what it is that they are experiencing in reading that they would not choose to do. I had a college student one day who said to me, you know, there's a big difference for me when I'm reading something that's just a sign that is really kind of boring to me or something I'm really interested in. When it's something that I'm not really interested in, my eyes are going across the lines and reading the words, but it's like I'm licking the words and I'm not chewing them. <laughs> I'm not able to engage and to be able to get that information into my head. Regulating alertness and effort and processing speed. Many people with ADD have a lot of trouble with sleep. And what they'll tell you is I often stay up a whole lot later than I really should because I found if I try to go to bed before I'm really, really tired, I can't shut my head off. I just keep thinking of stuff. You know, and so I just stay until I just get exhausted and then I fall asleep fine. But then once they fall asleep, they often sleep like dead people and they have a hard time resurrecting themselves in the morning. During the day, they're usually okay if they're on their feet moving around or talking a lot, but if they have to sit still for very long to listen or to read or do paperwork, the eyelids start getting kind of heavy. Regulating alertness is a difficulty that a lot of folks with ADD have. I had a college student who was on the track team, came in one day in my office and he said, you know, my mind is a great sprinter, but it's a lousy distance runner. He said, when the task I've got to do is something you do quickly in one chunk and then you're done with it, I'm fine. But it's something where you can't do it in one quick chunk. It's a longer term project. You have to keep chipping away at it day after day. That I have a lot more trouble with. And my approach then is either hurry up, slapdash, get the damn thing done. Let's not worry too much about quality control here. Or why don't we just set this aside and wait till it comes a little bit more of an emergency. And there's another thing that goes with this. It doesn't affect all people with ADHD, but many do, have difficulty with processing speed. And what they'll tell you is I often have really good ideas about what to write when I have to write an essay or I have to write a term paper or when I have to write my dissertation. I have a lot of good ideas about what to write, but it just takes me half a forever to get the sentences and paragraphs out of it. That processing speed of the mind. They can be quick in understanding, but they can be very slow in moving it and to put in words. Now, the DSM-4 and DSM-5 do not include anything about emotions. And that's a mistake that was not corrected in the DSM-5, unfortunately. But one of the things that those of us who do research and see patients with this, and anybody who has ADHD or who has, knows somebody well, would be aware of the fact that emotions, management and modulation of emotions, that's a pretty big deal for most people with ADHD. Often they find that when they get frustrated or irritated or hurt or they really want something or worry a lot, that it can come, that emotion can come up in them and, and sort of gobbles up all the space in their head. Like a computer virus might gobble up the, main, the, 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 the uh, mechanism of the, of the hard drive. And what they'll tell you is it, it's very difficult for me to be able to put it to the back of my mind. You know, I had a fellow one time who said, you know, I was at the diner yesterday, late afternoon, having lunch. I'm in a pretty good mood sitting there eating my sandwich. Guy in the booth behind me gets his sandwich. He's chewing too loud. He's going chomp, chomp, chomp on everybody. He said, there's something about that noise that's driving me nuts. It was as though a computer virus had gotten into my head and just gobbled up all the space. That's all I could think about was that damn noise. He said, I'm sitting with my fist clenched, seriously thinking about getting up and smacking this guy in the mouth because he's chewing so obnoxiously loud. I didn't do it. I didn't want to get arrested. But if I'd been at home, I would have been yelling at somebody. I would have walked out of the room. He said, that was strange, because after a few minutes, he's still making the same noise. It didn't bother me anymore. He says, stuff like that happens to me a lot. Will there be some little frustration? The kind of thing that most people on a scale of frustration, it goes from 0 to 10, would say it's a 0 or a 1. At the most, maybe it's a 2. Will hit me like it's a 7 or an 8 or 9. 
And sometimes I make a big fuss about it. Other times I don't say anything about this surge of anger. I feel like punching somebody or breaking something. Then usually it's over after a couple of minutes. But the fact is, most people with ADD will tell you that they've got some difficulty managing this stuff. And those same emotions can be very powerfully helpful to them and to others. But the problem is it's difficult often for them to be able to modulate them in situations where they really do need to. Memory. Ask people who have ADD, how's your memory? Often they say, well, I've got the best memory in my family. I can remember stuff nobody else can remember. They'll give you some example about some movie they saw 10 years ago. They've seen it just once, and they can tell you every detail of the entire storyline of that movie that they saw 10 years ago. Haven't seen it since. Or somebody else will say, yeah, went to the Super Bowl two years ago. I can still describe for you almost every play they ran during that game. Or somebody else will say, I have in my head 450 songs that were popular back in the 70s. All the music, all the lyrics, all the verses. But even though they're often very good about remembering stuff like that, sometimes it's systematic, sometimes it's random, if you ask them about what happened a couple of minutes ago or yesterday, often it's harder for them to deliver. You know, the problems with memory with ADD are not with long-term storage memory, it's short-term working memory. It's what you have to do one thing in mind while you're doing something else. It's the kind of thing you depend on. If you call, call the telephone operator up to get a phone number, you have to hold it in your head while you dial it because you don't have a piece of paper to write it down on. Often they'll start turning the numbers around. Or you go in the other room and get something and you're scanning there scratching your head wondering what the hell you came in here for. Or you're working on a project, you go downstairs, get something you need for the project, see something else that's answering, something else that needs doing. So you're, pretty soon you're up to your elbows in project number two, having totally forgotten you were in the middle of project number one upstairs, it was kind of important to get it done. Students complain, they'll be in class. Teacher asks a question, they raise their hand, they got a good answer for it. Teacher calls on somebody else first. You have to wait while that other kid says her shtick. Teacher comes back and says, yeah, what were you going to say? It's like totally clueless. Not only have I forgotten what I was going to say, but what was the question again? Or they'll read something, they'll understand it perfectly well at the time they read it. And then they go on and read a few more pages, stop for a second and realize their eyes are going over every word. They understood every bit of it as they were reading it, and now they have not got the foggiest idea what they just read. Or you're getting, what really drives them nuts, they'll study for a test the night before the test. You go over with them, they've got it, you quiz you, they'll get it perfectly. Go into class the next day, take it, and like a big chunk of what they knew the night before has evaporated. Can't pull it out of their head when they need it, but a few hours or a few days later, something jogs their memory, it's all back again. It's not that they didn't have it, it's they couldn't retrieve it when they needed it. Or you're getting ready to go someplace, you think of five things you need to take with you. Half an hour later, you're walking out the door, you got one of them. Can't remember the other four to save your life. It's where you have to hold one thing in your head while you're doing something else. Action. There are some people who are pretty hyper and impulsive, even in adulthood. But many who were get much less hyper as they get older and get better control of it. Uh, but the fact is, that whether they're hyper or not, many people with ADD complain that they have sometimes difficulty slowing down when they need to slow down and speeding up when they need to speed up. Or they sometimes have difficulty sizing up situations and find it kind of hard to modify their actions to fit what they're in right at the moment. Now, these are clusters, and it's not like everybody with ADD has all this stuff. But many will have difficulties in some of these uh, and the less difficulty in others. When are these things noticeable? It used to be that, that you'd only see it in preschool years. That was the way it was originally conceptualized. We now know there are some little kids where, you know, the people who turn up in our clinic at ages, you know, three, four, five, those are kids are very difficult to manage. They often have a lot of difficulty with sleep and they're very difficult to keep safe sometimes. They're really, because they're, that's usually the kinds where you're seeing primarily hyper. But there are many where you don't see it until the kids get along in school where they've got to work more independently, or when they're moving from having one teacher most of the day who can provide some of the structure for them, and now they're in a classroom for middle schools where they've got to move from one class to another, and that's a time when things begin to get a little shaky for some. But there's some where you don't see any of it really clearly, because sometimes the parents are providing so much scaffolding, so much structure to support them, that you don't even notice there's a problem until they get away from home, like they're going away to college or university, and suddenly that scaffolding is withdrawn, and you begin to see there are some difficulties that they didn't have recognized before. But sometimes it's considerably later. Let me tell you about a different angle of the research that we began in our clinic at Yale, and uh, have now published three papers on. You know, typically we say some of these symptoms are supposed to have been noticeable. When they used to say seven, now they say 12. But I can tell you there's some people with ADD, you don't even see it then. 
I found there were a number of mothers who were coming into my office with their kids, and we'd be reading off the characteristics of ADD as we're asking them to help us assess their son or their daughter, and the parents are saying, yo, <laughs> the apple has not fallen very far from the tree. But there's some others, a number of women who would say, and I'm talking now about well-educated business and professional women, very successful careers in, in their education and in their work, who are saying, you know, I didn't have that stuff when I was a kid, but I'll tell you, recently, over the last few years, my memory shot to hell. I'm not able to get things done the way that I wanted to, that I used to be able to do easily. I'm having trouble prioritizing and organizing things. And it finally occurred to me, you know, estrogen is one of the primary modular release of dopamine in the female brain. Most of these women that are complaining that way were between about 45 and 55 years old. Sarah is an example of it. This is from a case book. And, and, uh, and she had finished college and was working as a staff writer for a weekly newspaper and then uh, moved on to be a reporter for a very prominent daily newspaper where her output of news and features was really getting her good recognition. After, a little further on, she got married. She had several kids. And for about 20 years, she was not working outside the house. And then she decided once the kids were on their own, uh, she wanted to go to work. And she went to work and ended up getting fired. She was absolutely devastated. She was being asked to do minimal stuff. It was a, a one-lawyer office, and she was working as an administrative assistant. And she said, I can't remember what the guy is telling me, you know, the things he asked me to do. It takes me so long to get started on tasks. I get distracted and sidetracked at every step. I feel like I'm fighting brush fires, fighting to get one controlled and then discovering two or three others are flaring up. And I can't keep my priorities in mind, and I totally forget what the boss has asked me to do if I don't write it down right away. I'm not that old. I'm just 50, and my memory's a sieve. You know what's going on? That estrogen level dropping, it doesn't happen this way for every woman. But many women find that as that estrogen level goes down, they're not getting the firing. The neurotransmitters are not working the same way to be able to exercise those executive functions as well as once they did. And we've published three papers now talking about how you don't usually want to get into estrogen replacement therapy for treating that sort of thing. Uh, for one thing, it doesn't work very well. For another thing, it, there's some additional risks about cancer. But what we found was the medications we use for treating ADHD for many of these women are quite helpful. Uh, in terms of being able to address these problems. But that's simply to say that sometimes you don't see it when they're little and you get to see it a little further on. But now let's move on to the thing I was talking about before, the situational variable. This is a kid named Larry, 16 years old. Parents brought him in to see me. He was the goalie for his school's hockey team. Parents brought him in to see me. Uh, it happened, it was just after, the day after the team had just won the state championship in ice hockey. And so at the beginning of the conversation, they're bragging a little bit about how great he was in the tournament the day before. And they said he was, he was not only a really smart kid, but a really good goalie. They said when he's the net playing hockey, he missed nothing. He knew where the puck was every second of a fast game. Totally on top of it. The kind of goalie every team wants. Smart kid, tested way high up in the superior range, wanted to get good grades, was hoping to go to medical school, but he was always in trouble with his teachers. And what they say to them is, you know, once in a while, you'll say something that shows how smart you are. We'll be talking about something, you'll come in with some comment that's really very, very impressive. But then most of the time, you're out to lunch. You're looking out the window, you're staring at the ceiling, and look like you're half asleep. Half the time, you don't even know what page we're on. And the question they kept asking them was, if you can pay attention so well when you're playing hockey, how come you can't pay attention to sit in the class? Here's another example. A lot of times parents will bring in kids for us to see, and they say, well, the teacher says this kid can't pay attention for more than five minutes. We know that's not true. We have watched her play video games. And she can sit and play those video games for three hours at a time and not move. And the teacher said she's easily distracted. That's nonsense. When she's playing those games, she is locked on that screen like a laser. And the only way you're going to get her attention is to jump in her face you know, or turn off the TV. Now, it's not always problems with sports or video games. Sometimes people with ADD aren't into that stuff, but they might be into... You know, little kids you know, making Lego constructions that are pretty fantastic engineering feats. Some others, you know, maybe working in music and be gifted in being able to do that sort of thing. You know, there's somebody else might, when they're little, they're doing those Lego constructions. When they're older, they're taking car engines apart and putting them back together or designing computer networks. But everybody I've ever seen who has ADD has a few things that they can do 
where they can focus very well on those tasks or those activities, even though they may have a lot of difficulty in being able to do it with anything else. And so the question then is, and this is what I'm talking about as a central mystery of ADHD, why is it you can focus for this but not for that? And usually if you ask the people who are being questioned this way, what's up with this? They usually say, it's easy. If it's something I'm interested in, I can pay attention. If not, I can't. And most people hear that and they say, yeah, right, congratulations. That's true for anybody. Anybody's going to pay attention better for something they're interested in than for something they're not, which is true. But here's the difference. People who don't have ADD, if they've got something they've got to do and they know they've got to do and it's important, they usually make themselves pay attention, even if it's pretty boring, just because they know they've got to do it. People with ADD, it's incredibly difficult for them to be able to make themselves pay attention unless the task is something that really interests them. Not because somebody said to them, hey, you're going to get a better job review if you really do a good job on this, or you're going to get a better report card, but just because it is interesting to them for whatever reasons. Or if they feel they have a gun to their head and that something they think of as very unpleasant is going to be happening very fast, they don't take care of this right here, right now. Under those two conditions, no problem, and sometimes you see extraordinary accomplishments with their doing it. But when you have motivation, that variable from one situation to another, particularly when you're in school, and depending on what your job is, that can be a pretty good big problem. Big problem. So the question is, what the hell's going on? There are two central hypotheses. One is the willpower hypothesis. If you can do it here, you ought to be able to do it there. And there's no reason, if only you would want to hard enough, you'd be able to do it. And this happens especially with people who are pretty bright. People who are extremely bright often are told, what do you mean, you could fix this if you wanted to. All you have to do is try a little harder. Talk to people who've been hearing that for years, even when they're working damn hard to try and do it. Or people will say, well, you're so good here, we know you could be good over here. But I had a patient who gave me a way of thinking about this one time. He said, you know, I got a sexual example for you for what it's like to have ADD. He said, having ADD is like having erectile dysfunction of the mind. If the task you're trying to do is something that turns you on, you're up for it and you can perform. <laughs> but if the task you're trying to do is not something that's intrinsically interesting to you, if it doesn't turn you on, you can't get it up. And if you can't get it up, you're not going to be able to perform. And in that situation, it doesn't matter how much you may say to yourself, I need to, I really ought to, I should. You can't make it happen because it's simply not a willpower kind of thing. I think that's the most difficult thing for most people to understand about ADHD. It looks for all the world like it's a willpower problem. You can do it here, why can't you do it there? When in fact, it's not. It's a problem with the dynamics of the chemistry of the brain. So that gets us to this question, and I'm now talking not simply about people with ADHD, I'm talking about all of us. How does the brain determine whether we're going to ignore something or attend to it? To do it or to not do it now? Well, when you start thinking about it, it sounds simple at first, but the motivation is not really a unified variable. It's not just how much gas do you have in the tank. It's idiosyncratic. And it's very specific to particular tasks and situations. Because you see, every perception we have, every think, thought that we think, every task we address is instantly screened by the brain's own Google search system that pulls up relevant, mostly unconscious memories throughout the cortex. And then these compete to activate our getting into it, our staying away from it, or just not giving a damn. Luis Peso at Maryland has written a, a good book on emotion and cognition. He said, you know, emotion and cognition can't really dis be dissociated in the brain. It's the affect of the emotional significance that determines how the amygdala helps to separate what's significant to us from things we don't give a damn about. Earlier, Ken Dodge wrote about it, and he said, you know, all information processing is emotional. Emotion's the energy that drives and organizes, that amplifies and attenuates our cognitive activity. Emotional value for all of us, and this is not just those with ADHD, is automatically, unconsciously assigned to various stimuli, primarily by the amygdala and the medial prefrontal cortex, but there are other systems involved as well that size up how threatening is this, how important is it, how interesting is it. And then the amygdala, like two tiny little almonds deep in the brain, integrates this type of information coming in from all over the place. 
gives us a chance to see how big a deal it looks like and how, is it tilting toward wanting to or not wanting to? What, what's the cost of getting into it? What have I learned from previous experience like this and what's my motivational states to sort of see, how does this look to me right now? This is a diagram, it's, it's obviously not an anatomical diagram, but it's, they did a study, it's really a schematic of the amygdala and the connection to all the other parts of the cortex. And you can see all the abbreviations that just represent different parts of the brain the amygdala right in the middle of the blue circle. When they first did this drawing, it came out and they had 72 different regions of the cortex to which the amygdala was closely connected. 64 of, the, 70, of those 72, there were 64 to which it was closely connected. But subsequent studies have shown over a thousand connections between those particular areas and the cortical and some of the subcortical pathways of the brain. So how does this work? You get this rapid fire calculus of the amygdala and the related hubs that sorts out these competing priorities and emerge from what we know from our previous experience to mobilize us, shape our action, or say, no, eh, not now. And the output then from the amygdala over those various circuits shoots out to connect and activate body and mind or not. You know, and these motivations can operate very powerfully and unconsciously. You can see it in the research that's been done on implicit bias, in anticipatory sexual arousal, anticipatory anxiety, anticipatory grief, anticipatory hopelessness, and panic attacks that you see in clinical practice, despite the fact that people may have very contrary emotional experience. And so the amygdala Googling is very much filtered for context where you are and what you're doing and who's with you can make a big difference in terms of how these things are going to appear to these processes in our brains that work so unconsciously. Let me give you an example. My wife and I were on a flight over the Atlantic and we were on our way back. We were an American. We were lucky enough to be riding in business class. And as I, what I uh, remembered was a familiar smell. The America was at that time baking chocolate chip cookies in the galley <laughs> mid-flight, and then they would come and distribute them to the people who were in first class in business, which sucks for the people who were sitting in the back of the bus. <laughs> they could smell it, but they weren't getting any cookies. But it presented a little bit of a problem for me because I'd been on a diet for a while before that. You can see it wasn't all that successful, but the fact is, <laughs> that uh, you know, I had lost a few pounds and my wife was uh, functioning as the food police for me. She was usually pretty nice about it. You know, comments like, do you really need that? <laughs> you know, and oh, you've been doing so well recently. And I saw the flight attendant coming down the aisle with these plates of cookies and I thought, damn. You know, I really would like to have one of those cookies. But also there was another side of it in my head where I was saying, you know, I don't really need the cookie. It's not going to last that long, the pleasure of it. And actually, I'm kind of proud of myself that I can resist this sort of thing. And then I looked over to my side, and I saw my wife was asleep. <laughs> this made the decision process a little different. Well, I didn't have a long time to think about it, but soon the flight attendant thrust a plate with chocolate chip cookie on it in front of my face and said to me, would you like a cookie? And without any hesitation at all, I said, yes, thank you very much. And could you give me an extra one for my wife who's asleep? <laughs> you know where this is going. I ate both cookies very quickly, hustled my ass down to the galley and got rid of the plates with the cookie crumbs on them. Didn't bother my wife with that information until we landed, at which time we had a good laugh about it. Who you're with and what the circumstances are makes a big difference in how things work. For example, a student who works really hard to get every term paper in on time and well done may suddenly not give a damn about the paper because his girlfriend broke up with him and all he can do is think about who's, now she's dating somebody else. On the other hand, a student who doesn't usually care very much about getting papers in may suddenly intensify his interest if the coach speaks to, of his, of his uh, soccer team speaks to him and says, you know, uh, your grades are looking a little shaky, and if you don't get a damn good grade on this last project you're working on, uh, you know, you're going to lose your eligibility. And at that point, he may get very interested suddenly in doing it. The context makes a difference. So how does this work? What are the mechanisms of it? 
In the human brain, there are over 100 billion neurons, these little tiny infinitesimal cells. And each one of them is interacting with over a thousand others, but on the business end of the connection that carries messages from one to the other in these complex subsystems, and as they talk to each other, they do not actually touch each other. There's a little gap that most of you probably studied about called the synapse. And how do they communicate? Low voltage electrical impulses that have to jump across these gaps so fast that you can get 12 messages across in one thousandth of a second. Now this diagram here is showing you that there's a large portion of the, the uh, neuron which is you know, spread out like the branches of a tree collecting information, but then there is one business end of it where it's connecting down to the other, but notice there's a gap. And these things are so small you need powerful magnus, uh, powerful microscope to be able to see what's going on. So what we used to have was just measuring communication from one neuron to another. But more recent technological developments has shown us that the fact is that there's very little done by just one neuron. These things travel in cascades. They're transient, they reorganize themselves frequently and help to carry messages across to help us to be able to read out what's going on around us and in us and where we're gonna go and what we're gonna do. Most of the communication then is with these ensembles of neurons that are transiently joined to convey these bits of information across countless neurons and it's not like Morse code, but much more like the rapidly shifting chords of a symphony. But here's the issue. These cross neuronal signals are not all equal. They differ in strength depending on how important this person's brain perceives this signal, this message to be. How does it show the strength? It's not like it's pouring out different quantities of transmitter chemical. It's a matter of how much the release is triggered repeatedly. It's like the difference between one knock on the door and where you just get repeated signals in order to emphasize this is something important. We've known for a long time that people, all of us are born with a certain profile of temperamental biases. Jerry Kagan wrote about this. And he said, you know, these things create initial tendencies for us from infancy to become vocal or quiet, vigilant or relaxed, irritable or smiling, energetic, lethargic, with regard to specific situations or events. You know, and the fact is, if you go into an infant nursery, neonatal nursery, and you've got a half a dozen little infants there, newborns, and you make a noise like that, there are some of them that are going to get all rattled and startle, and there are others going to be like Buddhas, where nothing much bothers them. Those are just slight indicators of a much more complex process of the differences that we're born with. Uh, but they change as we get older. But there's another part of the process which is related to these executive functions I was talking about before. And that is we've also got top-down controls in ways that can bias our attention to intensify it and or to modulate it the way we're going to respond and size up any stimuli that we're exposed to. Any thoughts that are going through our head, anything we hear, anything we see is going to be processed in part with that. This is the, the top-down control is part of the executive function. It's the kind of thing which allows us to say to ourselves, chill out, it's not that big a deal. Or, yeah, I lost this battle, but I'm going to be able to find another way to be able to get around this. That allows us to be able to do that kind of adjusting that we have to do to deal with the realities of life for all of us. But let's turn for a moment now to the question of what has all this got to do with ADHD? You know, we know that this is an inherited problem in the development of the infrastructure of ADHD, and that some parts of the brain tend to be a little bit longer in their full development, but not for everybody with ADHD. There's a lot of differences from one person to another. It impacts the development of networks and communication be between networks. For example, the default mode network with some people, with the people that have ADHD, often they're a little quicker to slide into that default mode, which is just sort of spacing out and not too much thinking about any one thing. Now in that, they may be missing some things, but they may also be much more creative, much better able to see sides of the situation that other people might not recognize. 
And we know that it certainly impacts the communication between neurons. So the chemistry of motivation in ADHD, we've got pretty good evidence that you know, the dopamine reward pathway gets a little bit messed up under certain circumstances, but not always. But, and it's not constant, it's not unitary. And what I propose to you is that the difficulties that folks with ADHD tend to run into on these executive functions in motivation tend to be impairments of working memory and constriction or diffusion of their focus. Let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. First of all, I can tell you that we've got a lot of functional MRI studies now that show with adults and kids who have ADHD versus controls that ADHD involves their multiple large-scale brain networks that things just work a different way. It's not always a bad way, but a different way. And that often it's some things don't get turned on as much as they ought to be. But there are other times when things get turned on way more. And again, sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't. But the inconsistency in ADHD often re results from faulty interregulation between these networks. You know, and we've got fMRI and diffusion tensor images where you can study the white matter in the underneath of the brain, the subway of the brain, uh, about the connect connectivity that's involved in some cases. I mentioned the default net network. Uh, there are these differences which you can measure. But the fact is that there are a variety of ways in which they work for good and for problems sometimes. PET scans show decreased dopamine release in the reward circuits for some people. It takes a little more for them to feel like something is really worthwhile. And sometimes fewer uh, receptors in the, in the mopine. And what we have found, and we've got good evidence that methylphenidate, which is, many people recognize as Ritalin, it's a, just a brand name of, uh, for methylphenidate, the same way Bayer is a brand name for aspirin, and the other amphetamines that, the amphetamines that we use uh, tend to help increase the motivation for task when it's not coming out the way it ought to. Placebo doesn't. And we know that the modulation of emotion is often impacted and that it can make, as I said, it can make it better or more problematic. Sometimes the intensification is a blessing and sometimes it's a curse. But so why, why is it that many people with ADD complain of these things? that they have difficulty recognizing or responding to their own emotions. Well, sometimes it's a matter of the way the emotions hit them, the, the frustration or the transient wishes can gobble up all the space. Or sometimes it's a matter of getting worried. You know, for example, you know, one, one fellow that I spoke, about, who I spoke with uh, was telling me about how he was at work. He's walking down the hall at work, he said, a friend of mine from the other department is walking around the corner. He comes by. He's reading some papers as he walks. I hadn't seen him for a long time. So as we approached each other, I stopped and said, hey, what's up? How are you doing? If we stop and chat for a minute. He looks up, says hi, puts his head down, keeps right on walking. Now, I said, most, most people would blow it off in just a minute and figure, well, he's in a hurry. He's got to get to a meeting or something. We'll talk later. He said, not me. He said, that happened at lunchtime. I got nothing done for the rest of the day. I spent all afternoon thinking about, did I do something to piss him off? Or maybe I did something to offend somebody in his department. They're all angry with me. Or maybe I was just the kind of person nobody likes and nobody will tell me about it. I couldn't get it out of my head. Other people, it's not like that. They get an idea in their head of something they want to do or something they want to get or something they want to buy. And all of a sudden, that wish takes on such intense urgency, the feelings I've got to have it now. And it almost doesn't matter how expensive it is, how inconvenient it's going to be for them or for somebody else, or whether they're using time and money now for this or they know they need for something else. They just have the feeling they've got to keep at that until they either get it or you know, they get hit a brick wall. But then often they're off on something else, even if they do get it. Another, some people it's nervousness. You know, I had one woman who was saying to me, you know, I was on the expressway, I was driving the other day. I'm in the left lane, I've got the Jersey barrier to my left, 18 wheeler truck in the next lane over just a little bit ahead of me, cruising about 65 miles an hour. Truck starts pulling over a little bit. Didn't get in my lane, it got me thinking about how big his truck was, how small my car was. And pretty soon I'm thinking to myself, what would happen if he didn't see me? And he pulled over and squished me against the Jersey barrier. And soon, I'm not just thinking about it, I am running a very vivid movie in my head, imagining exactly what it would look like if that truck came over and smashed into my car, crumpled the car, sharp piece of metal is sticking in me, I'm bleeding to death, the car's getting dragged along the Jersey barrier, truck jackknives, cars and trucks behind us are hitting us repeatedly, massive traffic jam, takes a long time to get the rescue squad in to cut me out of the car. By that time, I've bled to death, they have to call my family and tell them I'm dead. <laughs> And all this while I'm trying to drive the car 65 miles an hour down the road. She says, stuff like that happens to me all the time. Where basically everything's going along okay, and I'm thinking, what would happen if this happened? Or what would happen if that happened? And pretty soon I'm not just thinking about it, I'm into it. 
Now, it's not like anybody with ADD has all this stuff, but many will have one or some combination of these, but what they have in common is that computer virus in the head thing that I was talking about before, and it just floods them. And sometimes when that happens, the working memory becomes problematic. Like I was talking with one woman one time, and she said, I hate Wednesday nights. I said, why? And she said, that's because they pick up the trash cans on Wednesday morning. I said, yeah. <laughs> and she said, no, you don't understand. We live on a hill, and we have to drag the trash cans down. And so my husband always wants our two teenage boys to drag the trash cans down and put them at the base of the driveway so that the guys from the trash pickup can get them the next morning. And then when they come home, after they get off the school bus, he wants them to pick them up and drag them up the hill and get them in the garage. And as long as they do that, it works out fine. If they forget, it's trouble. Because if he gets home at the end of a busy day and he's tired and he sees those two garbage cans sitting down there at the bottom of the can, he's, he's enraged. And he comes barely into the house, doesn't even bother taking his coat off, he's screaming for the kids to come, and they'll come and he says, you are useless, you are worthless, how are you ever going to be able to manage any responsibility in this world if you can't take care of something as simple as getting these garbage cans up and down the damn hill? I've asked you to do it repeatedly. You are not going to be able to graduate from high school, you're not going to be able to go on to college, you're not going to be able to sustain a relationship, you're not going to be able to have kids and take care of them. How are you going to be able to do anything if you can't do something like this? Have you no gratitude for everything your mother and I do for you? What's the matter with you? You're worthless. And she said, the kids have been smart enough that they've learned that you don't talk back to them at that moment. And they've also learned that later in the evening, maybe after he's had a beer or two, you know, he'll come around and mumble something about him. You know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be quite so harsh, but it, it happens. And she said, you know, I worry about that. And she said, you know, I know he loves them. He would give up his life for them, either one of them. But at the moment when he's feeling that frustration, it's as though that anger has just taken up all the space in his head. And he can't remember that these are his sons that he loves and cares about and wants to be able to protect and have them grow up so they can have respect for themselves and for other people. We all have times when we say stuff that's hurtful to other people without thinking enough about it. But that's a problem that, you know, that kind of emotion is difficult for many people to manage. And working memory has been demonstrated for many people with ADHD to be a problem. As I say, their long-term storage memory can be very good. And when they're into something they're really interested in, the working memory can be very good. But when it's not something that has that kind of interest for them, or worry about something that might happen, that can be a lot more difficult. But there's a second problem, and that is sometimes that focus can get so intense on whatever they're doing at that point that it's very hard for them to see what's going on in the rest of it. Imagine if you're trying to watch a basketball game through a telescope. You could get a very clear view of one little portion of the court, but you're not going to be able to see what the movements are, what the possibilities are, where the defenders are, what the moves are that you're going to be able to make in order to be able to get that basketball down on the other side of the court and shoot it. You know, and for many people with ADHD, what they'll tell you is, I often just miss a lot of details about the situation. Even though sometimes they'll zero on in some things that can be very helpful that other people may not notice. When did you skip the living too much in the moment? I was so excited to hear that. <laughs> I won't deprive you of that moment. This was a story, I'm trying to cut back on time so I finish close to when I'm supposed to. Uh, but the, uh, this is a story about a, a guy who was, uh, came home from work and he had a project he had to do which kept him up until about 2 o'clock in the morning. And at that point his wife had gone to sleep earlier and then she woke up and she came out in her best negligee <laughs> and, and said, uh, All right, wouldn't you like to relax a little bit? <laughs> and he said, well, uh, I'm really pretty tired. At which point she got upset and her feelings were hurt and that resulted in an argument that went on for another hour and a half or two hours. <laughs> you know, and so he, you know, he set the alarm, he had to get to work the next morning, there was a lot of important stuff that had to be going on. Uh, and then when the alarm clock went off, all he could think about was how tired he was. 
And so he turned the alarm clock off and went back to sleep. And he didn't wake up and, until several hours later and then finally hurried up and, and rushed to work and came in you know, a good two and a half hours late to work. And his supervisor met him as he was walking in and said, did you forget what I told you yesterday? The new boss is aware of the fact that you've been coming in to work late and he told me to tell you and I did tell you yesterday that if this keeps up, he's gonna fire you. Now you've done it. Now, I don't know if he's gonna fire you now, but not, but the, the point of this is this is an example of living too much in the moment, in this case of his fatigue, and not being able to remember at that time, I'm exhausted, but I damn well better get myself to work on time because of what I heard yesterday. Now, these executive functions, now that we get into this thing of what can we do that can be helpful, uh, depend primarily on two particular chemicals, dopamine and norepinephrine. These are two of the 52 uh, different types of neurotransmitter chemicals the brain manufactures. And they control most of the functions that are impaired in ADHD. And the brains of people with ADD make these chemicals the same way everybody else's brain does. They just don't release and reload them effectively a lot of the time. And as a result, some of the control messages of the executive functions don't connect as well. Now, for about eight out of 10 people who have ADD, the medications we have for ADD help to improve this, pro uh, this problem. You know, what do they do? They slow the reuptake or increase the release of these two transmitters. I'll show you a picture about that in a second. But it's important to say the medicines we have for ADD cure nothing. It's not like you have a strep throat, you take an antibiotic and it knocks out the infection. It's more like my eyeglasses. I have a problem with my eyes. I can't read typewriter sized print without my glasses. If I put these on, I can read it as well as anybody can. Take them off, I'm right back where I started. The glasses do not fix my eyes. They just help me see when I've got them on. And in the same way, these medicines operate for a certain number of hours, some for just a short time, some for much longer, but only for the duration of that medicine, and then you're back where you started. Another thing that a lot of people do not are aware of, including some prescribers, it, the amount of these medicines is not systematically related to how old you are, the, the amount that'll work for you. It doesn't depend on how old you are, how much you weigh, or how severe the symptoms are, it's how sensitive is your body to it. In our clinic, we see little kids, we see teenagers, we see adults. Most of the little kids are taking very small doses. But there are a few of them, just as small as all the rest of them, where we have to go almost to the top of the adult dosing range to touch them because their bodies are not that sensitive to it. And for them, that works when it would be way too much for most other kids of the same age and size. Among the adults we see, most are taking fairly hefty doses, but there's some of them taller and fatter than I am who are taking no more than you give a typical five-year-old. Go figure. You know, it's the fine-tuning of these things. And the problem is we do not have good programs in most of our medical schools or our graduate schools of psychology or our education schools to help the people who are on the fire line to help with these things to understand how this works and how to adjust, do the fine-tuning for these medications. This is the picture I was telling. This is just a cartoon, but what it's trying to show you is this is the... Uh, at the top, you've got the, the sending side, the presynaptic neuron, and on the bottom here, you've got the, the surface of the receiving side, the postsynaptic. These blue torpedo things are supposed to represent the receptors on the other side, and you can see that sort of uh, somewhat translucent uh, thing, which is supposed to represent one of the vesicles, and the little stars are supposed to be these little micro dots of the transmitter chemical as it's getting released. The reddish colored uh, torpedo type sh uh, uh, shapes there, those represent the transporters. And those are protein cells that work like little vacuum cleaners so that after the chemical is released, when the action potential comes shooting down, these things very quickly go <laughs> and suck the chemical back off the receptors so you can keep the system open and be able to receive new signals for it. Now, the one thing that both methylphenidate and amphetamine do is they slow down that reuptake process so that it lets it sit a little bit longer on the receptors. Why is that important? Because for people with ADD, often the signal comes through loud and clear for those things that really interest them and turn them on, but not so much on a lot of other things that may be important but not that interesting. And so, you want to let it sit on the layer for a little bit longer if you can, although we're talking milliseconds in this. This is not 
you know, for even minutes. Uh, and that's one of the things that methylphenidate and amphetamine both do. How, methylphenidate would be like Ritalin, Focalin, Concert, and so forth. Uh, the amphetamines, which would be like Dexedrine, Vyvanse, Adderall, they also have a secondary function, and that is they, they increase a little bit more the release of the dopamine from the presynaptic side. Now, if you happen to be somebody who's not releasing enough of it in the first place, that's a good thing. However, if you're somebody who's got enough out there, you start dumping a little bit more out there in the synapse uh, repeatedly, that's not such a good thing because it's a very sensitive balanced system. The problem is people do not come with labels on their forehead telling you which type of situation they're in. And we don't have good laboratory tests for that. So that's an example of, of the, the sort of the art of medicine in dealing with this particular kind of, of medication for ADHD. So I need to wrap up at this point, and I will be happy to respond to questions or comments that you'd like to offer, but let me just repeat the, what I think of as the key points. I'm trying to suggest to you that people with ADD, ADHD often have chronic difficulties with motivation in many, but not all situations. In some situations, they are superb. Secondly, the chemistry of medication is modulated by really complex processes that result from the amygdala integration of these idiosyncratic, emotion-laden memories that we all develop as we're living, that are embedded not just as separate things, but they're embedded in the way we see things and the various cognitive networks that process them. Third, working memory and focusing impairments that are often characteristic of ADHD may impair motivation by causing emotional flooding or constricted focus, the telescope or the Wednesday nights. And for about eight out of 10 people with ADHD, fine-tuned medication, underscore fine-tuned, will not cure, but can improve their ADHD impairments to allow them to exercise their strong abilities in a variety of things that may otherwise be difficult for them. So let me stop at this point, and I'd be happy to uh, receive comments or questions if anybody would like to offer some. Please. Yes, I'm wondering about dyslexia and ADD. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, dyslexia is, is just you know, fancy words for having trouble reading, basically. And it, the core of it uh, is the difficulty in being able to re remember and process how those, this or that combination of letters sounds and numbers. And there are some folks who have, uh, about 5% to 7% of kids have difficulty with reading problems like that. Some have difficulty with math problems. Some have difficulties of, of different kinds in terms of, of just sort of practical interaction. Uh, if you have ADD, you've got a higher likelihood of having one of those things. And in fact, it's not true just for learning disorders. It's also true for uh, a, a variety of other things. That, uh, a study that was done nationally, an epidemiological study of adults, demonstrated that when they were looked at a population of adults at age 44, that on average, they had six times the likelihood of having at least one other psychiatric or learning problem compared to people who did not have ADHD. Why? I don't think it's because they're unlucky. I think it's because the problems with ADHD are, have to do with the brain's management system. Think about if your PowerPoint program goes down on your computer, you're not going to be able to work with slides very well, but that doesn't mean you're not going to be able to use Word or Excel. If your operating system, if your Windows operating system goes down, you're going to have problems across the board. ADHD is more like the operating system than it is like one particular package of software. So yeah, you've got a higher in increase, but the other thing is it used to be that they would never diagnose ADHD in people who were dyslexic because they figured, well, you just need remedial help in terms of phonological processing. And what more the experts in that field have recently begun to recognize over the last five or 10 years is often the ADHD is there too and it gets in the way of their learning the stuff they need to learn or in their being able to read not just in a staccato way, but have some smooth automatized reading. Please, in the back. Yes, you. Okay, let's work with the microphone. Thank you.
specific thing, but they might see the other viewpoint of something, mm -hmm. which really spells out creativity. To yep, me. often. And I'm very interested because I have ADHD and, and I, I've experienced that things that were more creative, and mm -hmm. great at brainstorming, great at doing things that really allow the, the mind to skip around and jump and play and do all of that. Um, uh, and I work with a population that is like that as well. So I was wondering if there was anything that has been done looking at healing arts, you know, or, or, or the arts as a way to be able to keep People with ADHD more Some people with ADHD can respond to that because they've got those, those gifts. Right. And some of them are extraordinary in the gifts. But there are other people where their gifts are in different dimensions. Some are, their gifts are in, in athletics. Right. Some their gifts are in, in uh, mechanical things. They can build things and fix things. Some are amazing with electronic and computer stuff, IT things. So it's, there's a variety of ways in which people, I think it's really important not to get hung up on just the impairments of ADHD, but to appreciate the strengths that these folks have. However, it's also equally important to recognize when are the hardest times for most people with ADHD? Junior high, high school, and the first couple of years of college. Because those are the times when you have the least opportunity to escape from the ones you're not that good at. And if you're lucky, you may be able to get into a field of work where you can build on your strengths and may be very successful in the process. Okay? You pick. So if you have a child that's been diagnosed and has started taking medication at an early age, like when would you test again and how would you know if the child has outgrown ADHD? That's a, a, an important question. A lot of parents will ask, do I have to put my kid on this medicine? Is it going to mean that he or she's going to have to be on it for the rest of their lives? And our answer is, no, we don't know. There are some where they need to be on it for just six months or a year or two. There are others where they're going to need it you know, throughout the rest of their schooling. Some people, they need it most of their lives. And a lot of it depends on what the environment is in which they're working. It's just like you can have some kids with ADHD who thrive in classrooms with some teachers who just have an amazing gift for being able to help to build on their strengths. And you've got others who are harshly punished because they're not following the usual roadmap. You know, and so uh, the, the fact is that the, we routinely, and I think most of these people who are working in this field, routinely will have times when you've got people off medicine. You know, often they create it for themselves because they forget to refill the prescriptions. But uh, you know, there are times when they're going to run out and, and you take time off during a vacation period or something. But often, if it's needed in school, it's, it may or may not be needed on weekends and school vacations. For some people, that makes a huge difference in their being able to drive safely or in their being able to get along with other people. Other people, they don't need it for the rest of the time. They just need it for those things that they are faced, that they have to do, that just don't turn them on. Well, the reg if you're getting a stimulant medication, uh, the regulations are that the prescriber ought to be seeing the patient at least once every three months after they've stabilized on a dose. But that's like a 30-minute visit, so I'm saying like going to an Yeah, well, but if, the way I look at it is if they're having trouble, either because they don't like the medicine and how it's affecting them, or if they're just not functioning very well, or it used to work and now it's not working, it's time to go see somebody who knows how to look at those things. Let's, can we take a couple down here, please? Let's spread it around a little bit. I'm curious about treatment. So up here you're talking about medication is helpful to 80% of people with ADHD. Could you mention other types of treatment that you think are Okay, first of all, let me say the 80% comes from talking about stimulants, which is the ones that we've had the longest, we've got the most research on them, and for most people, they work the best. We've got several non-stimulant medications. There are some other medications that are in the process of, of you know, in the pipeline and are likely to be uh, they're in testing and will be coming out soon. However, I, I'm glad you asked that question because I can tell you it's not just about medicine. I was talking about what the medicine can do when it works, but the fact is, 
you know, it makes a huge difference if the person who has ADHD has people around them who can appreciate their strengths and are not just on their back all the time about what they're doing wrong. It helps a lot if they're going to school in a situation where there's an opportunity to show their strengths. But at the same time, they need help in being able to do the stuff you just need to be able to do. You know, and uh, so there's, there are many people that, that we see where you, you give them the medication and you get it stabilized and they're fine. They don't need much else. There are many people where their ways of thinking about themselves and other people uh, are things that require some talk. I do a lot of psychotherapy with individuals and with family members often. Uh, there are sometimes families need to sort out the way they've been doing business. Uh, there are times when, you know, when people need some encouragement to be able to adapt, you know, to find other ways of, of you know, de developing their skills. So it's not all about medication. Uh, one needs to look at these other pictures as well. But the medication can make a huge difference even in the person's being available to learn other stuff. Okay. Okay. Hi. Well, it's not just boys who are adopted, it's also girls who are adopted. Okay, ask yourself, who's likely to be having pregnancies that they don't want? Who's likely to not use protection? Some people with ADD. Some people with ADD are very careful about that sort of thing. But often, uh, the reason is not that they were adopted. It's that they may have been brought into the world uh, in a situation where the biological parents are not able to take care of them and they themselves may have had ADHD. This is highly heritable. So you really mostly I think it's mostly genetic, yeah. And then I just have to ask this too, the flooding piece, which is pretty Yeah. Do you have, a, have something that you offer about ameliorating some of that flooding? Well, yeah, and there's sometimes the stimulant medicines that we use help with that. You know, they, they don't tell you that on the label because they're, that's the way the FDA operates. It has to be just in terms of what the diagnostic criteria are. But often anxiety can be reduced and uh, some of the emotional outbursts are often helped with those medicines. And sometimes we need to use some additional medicines. There are some people who have to be on two or three medicines, at least for a while. Go ahead. Okay, so you, oh sorry. All right, go ahead, that's fine. Okay. Uh, but, but okay, and that helps with some of my executive functioning skills. Right. And I'm a second grade teacher, and I made my way through school, through graduate, graduate school. I, you know, I, I did everything, yay for Rachel, okay. But here's the thing, even with my medication, I struggle, and I have a wonderful husband who supports me with some of this stuff, but I still, I, I'm out there, I'm here, I'm looking for tools. Um, to help with my executive functioning issues. Mm -hmm. and, and even though I love my job, I have all of this wonderful support, and I'm so lucky, what, I, I didn't get your answer about the, the, the lady in the front asked about treatment. What else can I be doing to, to make myself function in the world as it is, aside from doing the best I can? I mean, where, I, mean I, I want like your list I want the list. Give me the list of all of the things I can do to be like a normal functioning human. So, I mean, I, honestly, I mean, isn't that everybody's question? I mean, that's been my question my whole life, and it still is, and probably will continue to be. But what can I well, do? Well, it sounds to me like you're doing pretty damn well <laughs> in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, we don't have a list. Uh, you know, the needs of each person, each individual, each family that we see in our clinic vary. And so do their strengths. And sometimes it's a matter of needing to shift gears because they're in a job that just doesn't work well for them. Sometimes they need to shift the way the family's working together and, and have people understand each other a little bit better. Sometimes some additional medications will do it, but we don't have anything that's gonna fix everything. 
you know, I can show you, I, uh, these are the books I've published. I think that the two that are on the left, the one above and the one below, uh, are outside, but they're not going to give you all the answers either. <laughs> um, the, the one on the bottom is mainly uh, 11 case examples of talking about the role of emotions in teens and adults. The one on top is trying to update our understanding of ADHD and both medication and non-medication treatments that we can use. But if you're looking for a recipe book, it's not there. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing what I can, but I don't have all the answers by a long shot. Okay. One more, one more question, Adrian. One more question. Dr. Brown, my question also has to do with the aspect of ADD that relates to the flooding of emotions and frustration and, and transient wishes. I'm a, a member of a five-person family, four of whom have uh, ADHD, and everybody, everybody's um, challenges Mm -hmm. <laughs> Makes life interesting, doesn't it? I certainly can't tell you what, what I would necessarily be able to, to, to see as useful for any one particular person. These are things that we have to tailor. Uh, but the, I can tell you that the classes of medicines that we work with most frequently are the stimulants. Are, we use them the most. There is more research on stimulant medication used in ADHD than there is on any other medicine any of you are ever going to take because we use them with kids. And there have been a lot more studies. But even those aren't perfect because you cannot run placebo-controlled studies over a long time involving people who have a disorder and not give them treatment. Yeah. So. Can you use stimulants on children with high anxiety and OCD? Sometimes there was, that's a clinical myth that, that the stimulants always exacerbate anxiety. There was a research paper that was published just a year or two ago where they did, reviewed 25 studies and they found in most of the people who are on stimulants with anxiety found the medicine helped to reduce anxiety, though it is absolutely true that there are some people where it jacks up the anxiety and you've got to do something different. The other thing that we often run into is that medicines like Concerta and Vyvanse and Adderall XR, which are designed to be long-term, they talk about sometimes as, as though they're all-day medicines. They don't last that long for some people. Sometimes. You know, the medicines that they say last for 12 or 14 hours last five or six at the most for some people. And so often the fine tuning involves not just how much medicine they get in a do dose, but uh, sometimes we have to give booster doses uh, and sometimes bookends to, you know, because we've got a, a medicine that starts late, takes an hour and a half to kick in, and the person's got to get started earlier. We have to do boosters of short acting before and after. But there's some folks with, med with uh, mood problems that are complicated, and sometimes with those people, we use something like an SSRI, like fluoxetine, you know, Prozac, Paxil, Luvox, things like that. Uh, those work for some people and not for others. And there's some where we'll use small doses of like Abilify, you know, or something which would be used for, uh, you know, in, in bigger doses for psychosis, but in very small doses for, for more heavy duty mood problems. So it's a variety of things. It's not any one size fits all. But if there's, if there's anything else that I can offer tonight is to try and say, this is complicated stuff. The brain is complicated. And uh, we know a lot more now than we used to know. Uh, but we've still got a lot we don't know. And so you know, this is still you know, a combination of art and science. Uh, I will be outside afterwards. There are brochures for our clinic on the table. And I think they're selling both the copies of both of the two books I mentioned. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.